So, um, there was a, a, a fourth century bishop by the name of Athanasius, and, and he was once quoted as saying this, most of the Bible speaks to us, but the Psalms, they speak for us. I want you to know that <laughs> the magnitude of what's going on in, in, in this room right now, it's not lost on me. I, I was praying backstage just before I came out, and, and I know that there is some deep, deep hurt in this room, and that's not lost on me either. But I believe that one of the beautiful things about the Psalms is is that no matter what we're going through, the Psalms give us words to communicate what we may not be able to communicate ourselves. And, and no matter what season of life you find yourself in today, Psalm 23 can speak to wherever you find you. And so as we get started again this morning, let's once again read this beautiful Psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. Our word for today is the word presence. And one of the reasons that I believe that Psalm 23 is so powerful is because it is so personal. I believe personal things are normally more powerful to us. As you read this, you'll see that there are no references to we or us or they, but you'll only find my and me and I and you. This Psalm, Psalm 23 is actually King David's testimony. This is his personal experience that he's had with God. I love this psalm's confidence. I love that this is what David, the man after God's own heart, really believes about God. This isn't poetry for David. This isn't theory for David. But this is how David has experienced God. He's heard his voice. He's, he's followed his lead. He has felt his care. They are beautiful words, but beneath the beauty of David's words, you find solid convictions that have been formed in moments of crisis. David, much like you and me, his life wasn't always just full of green pastures. It wasn't always peaceful or refreshing, at least not on the surface. Growing up, David, he was often over overlooked. He was the youngest of eight brothers. We, we, we can read in, in 1 Samuel that that David was actually in charge of the family sheep. So David was the family shepherd. It was his job to stay with the sheep, to care for the sheep, to feed the sheep, to water the sheep, to protect the sheep, and to provide for the sheep, and to keep them safe from all threats, both internal and external. But one day, Samuel was sent to David's house, to the house of Jesse, who was David's dad, and he was sent there with the task to anoint a new king. He had been told that a new king would be anointed in this household. And so Samuel, he goes, and Jesse, he begins to bring out his sons. And, and David, like I said, he was the youngest of eight brothers. And so, so Jesse, he brings out the oldest seven, but none of them are the one that Samuel is looking for. And so he looks to Jesse and he asks, he says, well, well is, is there another one? And, and Jesse said, yeah, the youngest, but... But he's out with the sheep right now. In other words, yeah, there's another one, but he's not the one that you're looking for. He's not king material. But he was the one that Samuel was looking for. And he would eventually become the next king of Israel following the reign of King Saul. Samuel, he would anoint David to become the next king whenever David was some of your ages. He, he was around 15 years old, but David would not become king until he was closer to 30 years old. And so for a decade plus, David spent much of his life on the run from a jealous and vengeful and powerful king. 
His life was threatened again and again. He spent many nights in caves just trying to find a way to survive, but through it all, David learned such an important lesson, and it's a lesson that I hope each and every one of us can learn as well, and here's what it is. He learned that hard times are not a sign that God's love is absent. Hard times are not a sign that God's love is absent. Our world today would disagree with that statement. To a certain degree, I guess I can kind of understand where they're coming from, but we are so quick to view hard times in our lives as evidence that that God either doesn't exist or if he does exist, he doesn't care. But while they may be common thinking in our world today and while in some churches that might even be common teaching, it is not biblical thinking and it is not biblical teaching. It is not who God reveals himself to be in the pages of scripture. So with that said, let's take a look here at verse 4 of Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff, every shepherd would have carried both, a rod and a staff. Both, both of these instruments had a very specific purpose, but the, the purpose was not, as David said here, the purpose of the rod and the staff was not to comfort. The purpose of the rod and the staff was to correct, it was to protect, it was to discipline. Both the rod and the staff, they were used for the benefit, uh, the, the, the benefit of the sheep. The rod was used to, to fight off Predators and external threats, it was used to whack a disobedient sheep if he was getting too far away. The, the staff was used as a way to kind of guide and direct the sheep along that right path. The hook of the staff was used to, to drag them back in whenever they got too close to danger, whenever they were wandering away. The presence of the shepherd brought protection both internally and externally. And Jesus, our good shepherd, he wants to provide the same thing for us, protection from self and protection from from evil. But there are a few phrases here in verse 4 that I want to point out to you this morning. The first one is this. David opens up by saying, even though. And I love that he said the word even though there because if you notice, he, he doesn't say if. It's not if I walk through the, valley, the, the, the darkest valley. It's even though I walk through the darkest valley. In other words, I'm telling you, you're going to walk through a dark valley. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when. He, he says that, that hard times will come. It's a promise. Jesus gave us the same promise in John chapter 16. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. The next phrase I want to look at is the phrase, the darkest valley. David is talking about about the darkest kind of darkness that you can imagine. Have you ever been in a place where it's the, I can't even see my hand in front of my face kind of darkness? That's the darkness that that David's talking about. In other translations, it's translated as the the darkest valley is the valley of the shadow of death. It's it's in this darkest valley where real pain exists, and and David was familiar with this dark place. You can look at David's relationship with King Saul, and, and you can view that as a dark valley, but I would consider that to be one of those external dark valleys. It's not that David did anything wrong, but he still found himself surrounded by darkness and and pain. Some of you can relate to that, can't you? I remember whenever I was 10 years old, and I noticed that my mom and my dad were no longer sleeping in the same room together. Some of you are here right now, and you know that feeling all too well. You didn't ask for it. You did nothing to deserve it, but it's still where you find yourself today. Some of you have possibly been to a doctor, and the doctor gave you news that you didn't want to hear, or maybe it wasn't you, maybe it was your mom or your dad, or an aunt or an uncle, a grandma or a grandpa, a friend, but somebody that you love deeply, they've just been told something that is absolutely terrifying. It's not their fault, it's not your fault, but it's dark. Some of you might be here today because your parents told you, you are going to go to this because your mom just got relocated to a new job and you're a new in a new city and, and you don't wanna be in this place, but your parents are saying, you're going to go and you're going to make friends. 
But all that you want is to go back home to where your old friends are. Some of you have recently experienced the loss of a loved one. You didn't ask for it, you did nothing to deserve it, but it's still your reality. Some of you have been hurt in ways that I can't even begin to imagine. You've been taken advantage of, and it's not your fault, but it's still true. It doesn't, it, it, whether you ask for it or not, whether you deserve it, like, it doesn't make it any less real. David, he also faced another type of darkness, though. There were moments in David's life when he was the most powerful person in the room, if you know what I mean. Like, I mean, literally, he was the most powerful person in the world. And there were times in David's life whenever he would abuse that power, whenever he would use that power and sin because of that power, and then he would sin more to try and cover up his previous sin, and he's... It's like he, he's in this dark place, but the reason he's in this dark place is because he put himself in this dark place. Some of you can relate with that as well. You've made some de de decisions in your life that have made your life more difficult than it needed to be. You've lied, you've broken trust, you are so far down, you don't even know how to begin to try and build it back up. Some of you have pressured a boyfriend or a girlfriend into doing things that you know you shouldn't have done and that they didn't want to do. Some of you have intentionally started to look at things that you know you shouldn't. You've seared images into your mind that will never go away. Some of you have considered the ways of Jesus and simply just said, yeah, no thanks. And as a result, your heart is cold. It's, it's hard, it's apathetic. Your, your heart, it is, it's dark. And I want to say this with as much compassion, as much empathy as I possibly can, but David, he understands. Yet because the Lord is his shepherd, he knew that in spite of his own weakness and his own failures, he knew in spite of the external and the internal darkness, that through it all, that in the darkest valley, that he could say, you are with me. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. This entire psalm is a response to David saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And one of the ways that, that David's life has been impacted by the Lord being his shepherd is that even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he is not walking through the darkest valley alone. David knew that life will not always be full of green pastures and still waters. He knew through his own experience that even when you follow the lead of the shepherd, difficult times will still come. He knew that because something was beneficial for us or just because something was for God's glory or just because something was for his name's sake doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. In fact, in most cases it's not. But nowhere are you promised that following the good shepherd will keep you from the darkest valley. Instead, what you are promised is that in the darkest valley, he will be with you wherever you go. But there's one more thing that I want to point out to you guys that I find so, so interesting about this text. And I hope that you guys will go back and, and look at it. You go back and you read verses 1 through 3 and, and you see that, that David, he, he refers to God in the third person. He's a he in, in verses one through three, but then you move into verse four, and, and David shifts from talking about God in the third person to now he refers to God in the more personal second person. He says, I will fear no evil for, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In verse five, he says, you prepare a table before me, and you anoint my head with oil. And so it brings up the question, why does David switch from talking about God as he to talking about God as you? And why does it happen in verse 4? Why didn't he just go on to say, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for he is with me and his rod and his staff, they comfort me. If I may, let me suggest this this morning. The move from he to the more personal you happens in verse 4 precisely because that's when he speaks of the valley in which he's walked. He, he, he's felt the shadows closing in, and in verse 4, he describes this crisis point in his life, and it's in those times that something deep happened between him and God. What we find is that in the valley, God moves from a he to a you, from someone that you know about to someone that you intimately know. We can talk about God in the green pastures, but we learn to talk to God in the darkest valley. In the valley, David learned that God really was his shepherd 
that he was a you and that he was with him. And David experienced God in a more personal way while in the valley church. This is such a massive and personal part of God's character. He is a never leaving, never forsaking, never giving up, always and forever, caring and loving and present God. And don't miss this. Because as you walk through this life, you will face seasons where you are going through the darkest valley where fear and danger are lurking in every direction. But as you find yourself in that place, there is one, there is a good shepherd who is constantly walking with us, who already reigns victorious for us. It was several years ago, uh, my oldest daughter, she's 17 years old now, and I think she was probably three or four. And it was the night before Easter, and um, as you guys know, Easter happens every spring. Another thing happens every spring that I kind of get excited about, and it's the start of Major League Baseball season. I'm a major Kansas City Royals fan, which has been torture most of my life. Had a couple of good years there, and they're playing, the boys are playing some ball right now, but... um, Back then, I, I, every spring, my evenings are likely full of just watching the Royals play baseball. And so it's the night before Easter, and I'm doing what I do. I sit and I'm sitting in my recliner, and I'm watching the Royals play. And my wife, she's on the couch with Whitley, and, 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 and she's reading to her this story about the crucifixion and, and the resurrection. And, and I'm watching the game, and all of a sudden, I hear this noise that will send shivers down every husband's spine. I hear the snap. And she goes, Andy. And so I pause the game. and Yeah. And she goes, and she pointed at Whitley. I go, yeah, honey, you're doing a great job. And I turn the game back on. A couple of moments later, I hear, Andy. Pause. Yeah. I know, this is an amazing moment you two are having together. Turn the game back on. Then the third time I hear, Andy! And I pause, and this time I was getting irritated, and I was like, what? And she goes, will you please look at your daughter? And I look over, and my three or four year old little girl is just weeping. And so I get up from the recliner and I walk over and I knew that I had ruined any moment to have a good father moment at this time. But I sit down next to her and my little girl, she just melts into my side. And, and I kind of look at my wife and I, as, as if to say, Heather, I, I got nothing right now. Like, you've done a great job so far. You get to carry this all the way home. And Whitley, she looked at me and she said, um, Daddy, they... They hurt and they killed Jesus. Then my wife preached what I consider to be one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard in my entire life because she she goes, yes, Whitley, they did hurt and they did kill Jesus. But that's not the end. Church, I want you to know because of the resurrection, we can know that Whatever dark valley that, we're, that we either currently find ourselves in or whatever dark valley we will one day find ourselves in, that is not the end. Can I read you some words that were spoken by Jesus after his resurrection? So like literally the resurrected Jesus is are speaking these words. He, he gathered his disciples together one final time. He had like this one last charge that he wanted to give them, this one last commission, this one last go and do what it is I've asked you to do. And this is what he said. He said, all authority in heaven and, on, heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And now listen to this part. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We will walk through dark valleys, but we can know that the darkest valley, that that is not the end. Because the promise of our resurrected king, our victorious king, is that he will be with you wherever you go. Will you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, 
I do just pray for the students in this room who are in that dark valley today. I pray for the adults in this room who are in that dark valley today. And God, I pray that that your Holy Spirit will comfort their heart, that they will be so keenly aware of your spirit, they will be so keenly aware of your presence, that their, 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 their friends and their adult leaders, that they will surround them and that they will love them, and Jesus, that we will be able to be your hands and your feet to, to your hurting people today. But God, may the power of your resurrection and the hope of your resurrection be experienced in this place, and in our lives today. We love you. We thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen.